Well, good morning and welcome to our webinar this morning, um, which is all about unclaimed tax. Um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce you to Craig Hughes, who's Director and Head of Tax at Brown Butler, uh, based in Leeds. Uh, so welcome, Craig. Looking forward to your presentation. Um, for those of you um, that are used to using Zoom, you'll be familiar with the, uh, the Q&A on the Zoom toolbar. Um, that's our preferred method um, for any questions that you'd like to ask Craig um, throughout this presentation. Uh, we do have a Q&A session at the end and uh, depending on the number of questions we've got, um, we'll try and answer as many of them as we possibly can. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to you Craig and look forward to the presentation. Thank you, Joe, and uh, good morning to everybody. Yes, um, today we'll be going through what um, we call our unclaimed tax webinar, which is basically looking at various um, tax reliefs and allowances uh, which are which are available and uh, which we should should be considering for um, for all of our clients where where appropriate. I'm always a little bit nervous about doing a presentation around tax, particularly in the current environment when there could be a budget or an autumn statement due anytime soon. So hopefully everything I say today will still be very relevant in the, uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, let's hope so. Okay, so starting off with uh, personal tax allowances, um, straightforward start relatively. Um, individual allowances, we are all aware of the, the personal allowance of um, currently £12,500 uh, per year. Some lesser known allowances potentially are the uh, blind persons allowance for people who are registered blind. That's um, £2,500 a year. The dividend allowance, which is a very important one, particularly for our own managed businesses, uh, whereby the first £2,000 of dividend income is, um, is tax free and that's per person. We also need to remember the savings allowance uh, for basic and higher rate taxpayers. So basic rate taxpayers can earn up to a thousand pounds of interest uh, tax free and higher rate taxpayers up to 500 pounds worth of interest um, tax free. I've put the over 75 allowance just on the slide, but it's not relevant anymore. It's just a reminder that um, that, um, that was removed uh, a few years ago now. And so the individual personal allowance now applies to, um, to everybody. I wanted to mainly uh, focus on dividend tax because this is an area where um, there are potential tax savings to be made through um, structuring uh, shareholdings, uh, particularly around um, uh, husbands and wives. There is um, uh, benefit in taking advantage of both the dividend allowance of £2,000, which I referred to earlier, uh, but also uh, the, the personal allowance as well. Now, income splitting, of course, has um, had some headlines you know, in, in the recent past, and particularly with the Arctic Systems case. And so you do have to be careful around splitting income uh, between spouses, making sure we don't fall foul of the um, settlements legislation, uh, for example. Um, but through proper structuring and, and, and use, they can be a very effective tool. Uh, likewise, using um, what we refer to as alphabet shares, so different classes of shares for different shareholders, they enable you to vote different dividends at different rates, depending on the, um, on the class of share. And again, that's something, if, if implemented correctly, can be very, uh, very tax efficient. I'll just go on to an example now, just showing how the use of income splitting can be a very effective tool in the right um, in the right circumstances. So here we have a probably a classic case of you know a husband and wife company own the shares 50/50 uh, between themselves and to draw uh, modest income and um, and uh, have modest uh, uh, or significant interest saving potentially. So here you can see overall that we've got £41,000 worth of income between the husband and wife and a zero tax liability. So, so how, how can we get to that position? Well, if you look at the fact pattern here, what we're saying is that they both draw a salary of £9,500. Not unusual in an owner-managed business to um, draw a, a, a very modest salary. 
They have interest income of, of £6,000 each, which may be in the current environment, might be a, a little bit optimistic and, uh, and you won't have too many clients with that level of interest income, but nonetheless, it, it's, it's useful to see this for, for an illustrative purpose. Uh, and then we have dividend income of, um, of £5,000. So the husband and wife each earn £20,500. They each have a personal allowance of £12,500. So their taxable income, before we look at any um, allowances, is £8,000 each. Now when we break down the income streams there, we start with um, the interest income and because their non-savings income is below £17,500, we can benefit from the first £5,000 worth of interest income being at a zero rate of tax. The next £1,000, as they are basic rate taxpayers, is also tax-free. So just looking at the interest income alone, what we have there is £6,000 worth of interest income completely tax-free due to the starting rate and also the personal um, savings rate. The salary, of course, is covered by the personal allowance. So £9,500 worth of salary, we're using £9,500 worth of personal allowance against that, so no income tax on the salary. And we still got £3,000 worth of personal allowance remaining. And remember, you can use your personal allowance however you want to. There is no order of use, so you can set it up against whichever income stream you, you want. So we have £3,000 worth of personal allowance left to utilise against the dividend income. We have £5,000 worth of dividend income, so that's £3,000 of the personal allowance remaining. So there's £2,000 worth of dividend income left taxable. However, remember we all have a £2,000 nil rate band for dividend income. And so that is also tax free. So in this perhaps rather simplistic example, but nonetheless hopefully helpful in explaining the interaction of the various release and allowances shows how it, with this particular set of circumstances, you could have £41,000 worth of income and no um, tax liability. So moving on from income tax, uh, inheritance tax is something that um, gets more attention as time goes on. It's you know, at a rate of 40%, which is not insignificant, but there are various allowances and nil rate bands available. Uh, we have the basic threshold, the basic nil rate band of £325,000. So again, everybody has a nil rate band for inheritance tax of three to five thousand. So if the estate is less than that, there shouldn't be any inheritance tax to pay. What should also be remembered is that with spouses, on death of one spouse, the any unused nil rate band can be transferred to the other spouse. So if the spouse who has died first hasn't used their nil rate, the surviving spouse could have an L rate band of up to £650,000, 325 times two. What was also introduced three or four years ago was the additional main residence nil rate band. And this is to cover the family home. And the, the idea behind this was to introduce a further nil rate band, which effectively gave everybody a £500,000 inheritance tax nil rate band. So you have £325,000 with your personal nil rate band and £175,000 with the residence nil rate band. And for husband and wife, that means in principle, you could have a million pounds worth of assets in the estate fully covered by both the personal nil rate band and the residence nil rate band. Now, as is often the case with generous allowances like this, there are some strings attached um, to the uh, residence nil rate band. And the main one is that once the estate 
becomes more than two million pounds, that additional nail rate band for residences diminishes. It tapers away until we get to 2.35 million when it's gone altogether. So for a state over 2.535 million pounds, the only um, nail rate band available is the 325,000 uh, pounds personal nail rate band. Now, one important point to note around that two million pound threshold for the residence nail rate band is that that applies to the gross estate. And what I mean by that is that you ignore any other reliefs. So anything such as business property relief or agricultural property relief is ignored. So you could have the scenario, and not an uncommon one for many of our clients, where they own a business uh, and the business might be worth, I don't know, three or four million pounds, uh, but it's a trading company. And so ordinarily the shares, you're not worried about inheritance tax because you've got 100% business property relief. But when you're looking at whether the residence nil rate band applies, you ignore any business property relief. So that three or four million pound uh, business would mean that you'd break the uh, threshold of, of two million as far as qualifying for the residence nil rate band. So just an important point to um, remember as far as that's concerned. It's not as straightforward as just looking at the, uh, what would be chargeable to inheritance tax. Aside from the nil rate bans, just in inheritance tax in general, um, don't forget the general IHT planning around um, making regular gifts out of income. So if an individual makes regular gifts of um, any, any amount in, in essence, as long as they're regular, as long as it can be seen that they're coming out of their uh, income that they don't need, then those aren't potentially exempt transfers as far as inheritance tax is concerned. And so wouldn't fall back into the estate should that person die within seven years of making uh, making those gifts. Trusts also have still have their place as far as um, IHT planning is concerned. They're not great from a, a, a tax perspective anymore. You know, trusts are taxed quite heavily, but um, as far as income tax and CGT is concerned, but when you're looking at from an IHT perspective and perhaps separating um, ownership and control of assets, um, then trusts can certainly have their, have their place, um, particularly around things like um, providing uh, an income for grandchildren's um, school fees, for example. And finally, on IHT, I just want to uh, mention wills um, and powers of attorney, not tax related at all, really, although clearly there would be some input from a tax perspective into somebody's will. But just from a general housekeeping point of view, it's important that uh, clients have their wills up to date uh, and powers of attorney uh, are becoming more and more important now in terms of being able to um, operate that estate. If, if somebody becomes incapacitated, um, for example. Okay, moving away from personal tax reliefs and personal tax allowances, we're now moving into the um, corporate sphere and R&D tax credits. Now, this is, uh, these are a very valuable relief that have been around a number of years now and, uh, and certainly something that can apply to perhaps more clients than you might envisage initially when you think about the, what, what R&D is. The relief is in two parts. There's a, a relief for SMEs, and I'll come on to later and to uh, um, define more what an SME is, and there's also a large company relief. So we have two, two systems in place. The SME relief was introduced um, over 20 years ago now, uh, which certainly makes me feel old, uh, given that I very much remember the days when that was, uh, that was introduced. Uh, the large company relief came in a couple of years later, and the legislation has evolved over the years. Um, very favourably in, in most cases as well, the relief has become more generous um, in terms of its, um, uh, the quantum of it and how it can be, how it can be applied. There are essentially three um, fundamental principles for, for R&D relief. You need to be a qualifying company, so are you an SME or a large company? And it's important there that it does only apply to companies, so partnerships, LLPs and sole traders um, can't get R&D tax relief. You need to be undertaking qualifying activities, so 
is what the company does, is it R&D? That's, that's a starting point. And then you need qualifying expenditure. So only certain types of expenditure can qualify for R&D relief. And over the next few slides, I'll expand more on each of those three particular principles around the, uh, around the relief. So starting off with the technical criteria. And this is one that has caused, I think, a little bit of confusion over the years. What is R&D? Now, R&D has a specific definition uh, for tax purposes. There's a lot of words on this slide, and uh, forgive me just for reading, the, re reading through them verbatim, but it's important that this, this underpins what can be, uh, what can be claimed. So R&D tax purposes takes place when the project seeks to achieve an advance in science or technology through the resolution of scientific or technological uncertainties. It includes new processes, products or services, making appreciable improvements to existing ones and using science and technology to duplicate existing processes, products and services. Pure product development in itself does not qualify. So what does that mean? Well, as a starting point, what you need to be doing, the, the project needs to be looking at an advance in the field of science or technology. And that could be very wide ranging. What you also need to do with the project is that you have to be challenged. There has to be some kind of uncertainty there. Can we get from A to B? Can we make this drill that goes around corners? What, 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 is, what is blocking us from, from doing this? You have to demonstrate that you've tried to overcome that uncertainty. Now, the important thing here is it, it doesn't have to be a success to be qualifying R&D. So if, you've, if the business has tried to overcome an uncertainty but actually not achieved it, then that can still be R&D. And finally, to, to be R&D, when you're going through trying to resolve those scientific and technological uncertainties, the way you go about it and the successes or failures, they can't be easily worked out by a professional in the field. This concept of a competent professional, as HMRC call it. So if a company is, chased, is faced with a technical challenge, if it's relatively easy to overcome because it's been looked at before or there are lots, there's lots of publicly available information about how to get from A to B, then that probably won't be R&D. But the important thing here is that R&D can apply in a broad range of circumstances. And you may have heard this before, I mean, it's not about a laboratory, people in white coats with bunts and burners, you know, clearly those sorts of businesses would probably have some R&D going on. But it can apply in practically any sector. What you need to be showing is that there's some kind of issue or uncertainty or challenge. That could be from an engineering perspective, a manufacturing point of view. We do a lot of claims in the sphere of software development. And with software, a lot of the R&D can arise from the integration of various pieces of software working off different platforms. Whilst those individual packages might be off the shelf or, or, or very straightforward packages in their own right, when you're trying to build them into something larger and integrate them, that's, that's the clever bit of such. That's where R&D can be undertaking is in that, um, in that integration. And so it can be quite, quite wide ranging. And again, I'll come on to later with just some thoughts about what you need to be looking at when considering whether a company could be undertaking um, R&D. So I talked earlier about there needs to be qualifying expenditure in order to um, uh, qualify for the enhancement for, for, for R&D relief. And there are defined categories of expenditure. It's not just on anything. The main one is typically staff costs. So as far as staff costs are concerned, you can claim for the gross salary, employer's NIC in respect of that person, and also any employer's pension contributions that the company makes on behalf of that employee. Now, with staff costs in particular, what you have to look at is 
what proportion of time does an individual spend on R&D? HMRC would require some convincing that somebody spends 100% of their time doing, doing R&D. Uh, they will undoubtedly be doing some more routine uh, matters as well, as well as admin type, type tasks. However, the revenue also um, very pragmatic about that. You know, they recognize that not all businesses will have detailed timesheets which will set out exactly what person A, what time they were spending on R&D, and what time they were spending on non-R&D projects. So typically, uh, taking a percentage of somebody's time would be sufficient, so long as that can be substantiated and looks reasonable. The other category of expenditure which can qualify for R&D is subcontractor costs and also externally provided workers. So this is either R&D work that the company subcontracts out to somebody else or they have to bring in some external labour to uh, undertake the R&D. Uh, those costs can be, uh, can be claimed, however the enhancement is restricted to 65% of those costs. There's a recognition there that from those subcontractors and externally provided workers there will be a markup in respect to the services they are providing and so there's an arbitrary 65% um, um, restriction there. So £100 of subcontract costs, you can only claim the enhancement on 65% of those costs. Software directly used in the R&D, you can claim the enhancement on, on, on that expenditure. And again, if you have some software that has a dual purpose, it's all about trying to allocate an appropriate percentage between the R&D and non-R&D element. And finally, consumable items. So this might be light, heat and power. So again, an apportionment of the total cost there, but also things like materials. So if prototypes are built, if um, test runs are undertaken to, to, to test the R&D, then materials consumed in those processes can also qualify for the enhanced uh, deduction. So what is the relief? What's it worth to a company? So as far as the SME relief is concerned, you get a 230% deduction. So for every £10,000 of qualifying R&D expenditure, you get a tax deduction of £23,000. So you get £10,000 anyway because it's a revenue expense, but you get another, another £13,000 uh, on top of that. So effectively, you gain tax relief of 43.7% on qualifying expenditure. Now, if a company is loss making, uh, you do have the um, ability or the flexibility to surrender that loss for a refund from HMRC. So you could carry that loss forward and set it up against future profits, or you could surrender it for a cash refund now. And you can make that choice, you're not uh, railroaded down one particular course of action. You'll note that the the rate of refund is at 14.5%. So if you carry the loss forward, you'd get relief at 19% or whatever this corporation tax might be, rate might be in the future, compared to 14.5% by surrendering, surrendering it now. But certainly in my experience, and particularly in the current environment, uh, it's very much cash is king, and you'd rather have 14.5% now rather than hopefully having 19% in the future. I'll come on to some examples later showing how those um, how that relief works practically. Now with the large company relief, rather confusingly, it works in a completely different way. So we don't have an enhancement on the expenditure. What we have is what's described as above the line uh, relief. And the way that works is that effectively, from April this year, April 2020, the relief has, um, has, has, has gone up from that date. The credit is worth 10.53% of the qualifying R&D expenditure. So for £10,000 of expenditure, you get a reduction in tax liability of £1,053. Similarly to the SME companies, a loss-making large company can surrender that um, credit for a refund. It should be noted that both for the SME relief 
and for the large company relief. There are some proposals in play at the moment, which would mean that from April next year, the refund will be capped at three times the PAYE and NIC payments made by the company. Now, you may recall that when R&D relief was first introduced 20 years ago, there was a capping of repayments at that point in time as well. And that was removed uh, probably oh, maybe 15 years or so ago now, but that's coming back in potentially from April next year, unless anything significant changes. There is also a, a position where an SME can claim the large company relief, which again is rather confusing, but on some subsidised expenditure, for example, grants and work subcontracted to them from a large company, neither of that expenditure can qualify for SME relief. So you could have a scenario where an SME is claiming both the SME relief, the 230% uh, enhancement, and also claiming large company relief on some of their R&D &D expenditure as well. So they can get a little bit confusing at times. Grants and subsidies is an important um, topic as far as R&D relief is concerned. Now SME relief is a notifiable state aid. So if any funding for the R&D project is coming from another notifiable state aid, no SME relief is available because you can only claim one notifiable state aid, but you can still claim the RDEC, the large company relief. If the grant or subsidy isn't, notif isn't a notifiable state aid, then you can get SME relief on the unfunded element. This is what I was referring to earlier about an SME potentially claiming two types of, uh, two types of relief. Now there is a little bit of uncertainty around at the moment around uh, the various funding that's being put in place for COVID, such as C-bills and the potential impact on R&D claims because that funding is a state aid. Now we are waiting for further clarification from HMRC in terms of how they will apply that to R&D relief. So this would apply to any R&D projects which have been undertaken since March this year, which have been funded in full or in part by any of the COVID-19 funding. Some of the relief on those R&D projects may be at the RDEC rates of relief rather than at the SME rates of relief. Like I say, just wait for clarification on that point from HMRC. Just quickly run through the um, criteria in terms of what makes a company SME or what makes a company large. Uh, an SME, less than 500 employees and either less than 100 million of turnover, it's expressed in euros because it's an EU um, directive, or a balance sheet of less than 86 million euros. Balance sheet total is uh, gross assets. It's looked at on a, um, on a group basis, um, and you also include companies who have a shareholding of more than 25% in the SME company as well. There are transitional rules when a company might flip from being an SME to, to, to a large company and vice versa. Typically there's a, um, a transitional year involved there, so it's, you're having to meet that criteria for the two years running in order to fall out of one criteria and into the other. Um, you do need to be careful around any corporate shareholders in the, uh, in the SME company and this can include institutional investors where they have more than 25 percent you in certain circumstances you'd have to bring in the financial figures for that investor which could make an sme into a large company uh, potentially it's quite complex rules around that and there are some exemptions for private equity and, and such like so i'll just run through an example in terms of how the sme relief works and what, and what the benefits um, uh, might be so here we have a company, Albarn Limited. It's an SME company, taxable profits of 400,000 for the year, ended the first March 2020, and included in that is 60,000 pounds of qualifying uh, R&D expenditure. So if they didn't claim the relief at all, very simply, um, they pay 19% corporation tax on 400,000 pounds worth of profits. If the R&D enhancement is claimed, they would have a deduction of 78,000 pounds 
from that £400,000 worth of profits, i.e. 130% of £60,000 of R&D expenditure. So the corporation tax liability will now be based on £322,000 of, of taxable profits at 19%, that's 61,180. So they're a saving of £14,820 by making the, the uh, R&D claim. I'll run through an example in terms of how it works from a um, repayable tax credit position. So here we have another company, Roundtree Limited, again an SME, this time it's got a loss, whopping loss, £200,000 for the year ending March 2020, and included in that is still £60,000 of qualifying R&D expenditure. So if we didn't, did nothing, don't claim the relief, we'd carry forward £200,000 worth of losses, and that would give us a future tax benefit of £38,000, assuming the corporation tax rate remains at 19% in the future. If we make a claim for R&D relief, we have an additional deduction of £78,000 again, so our loss has now increased to £278,000. We can surrender the R&D element of that loss, the £138,000, for a repayable credit and this is at the rate of 14 and a half percent, if you remember. So that's 20,000 pounds, 20,010 pounds. We can only surrender 138,000 pounds because that's the R&D part of it. So the 60,000 pounds of expenditure plus the 78,000 pounds of enhancement. So we're still left with 140,000 pounds of losses, which we carry forward. And so the future benefit there is at 19% is 26,600. Or what we can do, is carry forward the whole loss of £278,000 and that gives a potential future benefit of £52,820, again assuming we're at 90%. So we've got a choice here, we can get cash now of £20,000 and 10, carry forward £26,600 worth of losses in tax terms, so that's just over £46,600, or carry forward the whole loss and get a future benefit potentially of £52,000. So there's a choice to be made and again like I said before typically clients will go for the cash now. Um, it's, um, it tends to be the, 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 the rational solution to, um, to make and the benefit is only 4.5% at the moment as well remember with corporation tax rates being at 19%. Uh, so that's how it works as far as the repayable tax credits is concerned. Just quickly around how we claim R&D tax relief. It's part of the corporation tax computation and CT600. You have two years from the end of the period to, um, to make a claim for the relief. So it's not something that needs to be done urgently. With SME claims, the revenue do tend to, tend to process these in around 30 days. Um, R debt claims can take and do take longer. The revenue has um, 12 months to inquire into a R&D claim or something, it's a bit like the normal self-assessment process. And there is a specialist department in HMRC which deals with um, R&D. And this is helpful because they are, or they can be quite pragmatic in terms of uh, helping a client uh, claim, the, uh, claim the relief. So just finishing off on, on R&D before I move on to capital allowances. Some questions that um, you might want to consider around whether a company might qualify for R&D relief. So has it developed its own software? Has it developed internal processes that reduce costs and improve production times, improve efficiency? Uh, do they carry out any design work that enhances technology? Uh, manufacturing products? Are they using existing technologies in a unique and different way? And that can include reverse engineering as well. Are you combining two or more existing technologies in a new and innovative way? Um, and if there are any patents um, for products, um, that is a very good indicator that the R&D might be, might be taking place. So finally, just to wrap up, um, we'll just talk around capital allowances. So here we're back into the sphere of corporate tax or, or business tax for uh, unincorporated businesses as well. So where are we at the moment? Well, we have the annual investment allowance, which gives 100% um, relief for qualifying capital expenditure. 
the next slide I will explain what's happening at the end of the year as far as that is concerned because at the moment it's a million pounds worth of expenditure. It should be going down to 200,000 pounds from the 1st of January and that could have a significant impact in terms of how that works on the transition for businesses whose periods overlap the 31st of December. So I'll come on to that shortly. And then we have the writing down allowances. So main pool, 18%, uh, special rate pool at 6%, and single assets pool either 18 or 6 percent. We've now got the um, structures and buildings allowance as well, uh, a 3 percent straight line allowance, uh, and this is for uh, commercial property. Uh, you may remember the industrial buildings allowance. It's along similar lines um, to that in some respects. Um, it only applies to the buildings and, and not land, um, but it's a um, it's an allowance that came in in October 2018. Any expenditure incurred after the 29th of October 2018 qualifies for the structures and buildings allowance. So it's, again, it's something not to forget about because when you're looking at a new building, yes, you can look at the integral features and the uh, general pool items in terms of the, you know, the air conditioning and the fit out and the electricals and all that kind of thing. But the structure of it, you know, the bricks and mortar, the roof, the walls, Typically, they won't qualify for any allowances at all, or they wouldn't have done. But now they, they, they should be able to qualify for the structures and buildings allowance. So finally, I just wanted to mention this around the annual investment allowance and the fact that it's reducing from 200,000 pounds to, sorry, reducing to 200,000 pounds from a million pounds from the 1st of January next year. Now again, this is pending anything that might come out in any future uh, autumn statement or, or budget, but this is where we are at the moment. And so where you have a company or a business where the accounting period straddles the 1st of January, there's a potential issue here in that the way the AIA works is that if, for example, you've got the 31st of March 2021 year end, you work out the AIA for the year, and that's simple pro rata basis. So nine twelfths at a million, three twelfths at 200,000. So that's an AIA of 800,000 pounds. However, for any expenditure that's incurred from the 1st of January, 2021 to the 31st of March, 2021, only 50,000 pounds of AIA can be claimed in respect of that expenditure. And that's because it's three twelfths of 200,000 pounds, the new AIA rate that's coming in from the 1st of January. So you could have a business that's got significant capex for the year, but if it's back end loaded uh, for the first quarter of next year, whereas they may be expecting to claim AIAs because they've spent less than £800,000 throughout the whole year, if more than £50,000 of that expenditure is in quarter to March 2021, that won't qualify for AIA, only the first £50,000 will. So there might be some conversations to be had there about potentially accelerating any, any capital expenditure uh, into, into the current year. And clearly there are commercial considerations to consider around that, but purely from a, a capital allowances perspective, that's something that, um, that needs to be considered and not, and not forgotten. Well, that's all I wanted to cover today. I hope you found that um, helpful and useful. And if you've got any questions, um, please feel free to, to ask them. Well, I don't think we've got any questions coming through there. So again, thank you for listening. And if you need to get in touch with me, my name is Craig, Craig Hughes. I'm the uh, Head of Tax at Brown Butler Accounts in Leeds. So please do get in touch.